The topic is common mode current and chokes. What is common mode current and what can you do about it? What is the idea behind a common mode choke? Now we've all seen uh, LEDs. We've, we've played, I, I bet you everyone here has, has messed with LEDs at one point in time or another. And you get a battery and you have an LED and if you connect the battery directly to the LED, you fry the LED, right? So what do you do to fix that? You put a resistor in series, a current limiting resistor in series with the, with the LED to make it so that the LED doesn't draw so much current. And you carefully choose the value of that resistor so that the right amount of current goes through the LED. Good. Now, you have an AC circuit. You have a load out there. You have an AC source. What can we put in there? Well, we could put a resistor in there, but we could also put an inductor. An inductor will act like an AC resistor, so to speak, as its impedance increases with frequency. And so we can limit the amount of current at a particular frequency getting to that load R2 simply by changing the value of the inductor. And the bigger the inductance, the less current that you're going to get. Well, the problem is we can't put a resistor in series with the outer skin of the coax. Not happening. I don't know how you'd ever do that. And you can't put an inductor in series with the out, outer skin of coax. But you can increase the inductance of the outer skin of the coax. If we can do something to increase the inductance, that increases the overall impedance of the outer skin of the coax, and thus we current limit our common mode current. One way to do this is to wrap the coax around the proper mix of a, of a toroid core or a rod. This is one that I built here. And this stuff here, uh, this is a ferrite core. These are not cheap. This is, what, $15, $16 for that core. I bought a rod. It cost me 25 bucks for the rod. You wonder why some of these these uh, ferrite common mode chokes are expensive. Now you know why. But this is still cheaper than buying it. I did an experiment just adding one turn at a time. This is where I began with my experiment. An Amidon FT-240-K toroid core. First I calibrated my VNA. Then I wanted to see what happens if I just connect to some coax without any core. Then what would happen if this coax just passed through but did not wrap around the toroid? Next, I started wrapping turns around the toroid. First one, then two, And three, four turns, and five, six, seven, and finally eight, all on one side. Now I heard that splitting up the eight turns, four on one side and four on the other, helped, so I tried that too. And it did add effectiveness. So how did this perform for me? Now you notice the broadband characteristic of this though. Down in the 80 meter band, we're looking at about 17, 18 dB of, of attenuation. You get up into the 40 meter band and we're looking at about, oh, 20, 24, 25 dB. You get up into the uh, the 20 meter band, now we're, now we're pushing 30 dB. That's this. It takes more time to put the connectors on the end of the cable than it does to, to wrap the coax. So that's one way to do it. Another way to do it, and you've seen this done, is uh, putting 
lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of ferrite beads on the outside of your coax. These are pictures I got off the internet of commercially available common mode, common mode chokes. The one at the top has 25 slide on beads. 25. Now those you have to put on before you put the connectors on. <laughs> the one on the bottom, there's a lot of snap on beads, but you have to be careful with what mix is inside. Problem with snap on beads is finding ones with the right mix. Uh, if you don't get the right mix, because each mix of ferrite material works differently at different frequencies. That's why I say the right mix. And the only reason why I chose this particular mix for this is because I got an Amidon uh, uh, Ballon kit that used this that was intended for these frequencies and I trusted that it was the right one. <laughs> but you can really get into looking at specifications for ferrite materials to come up with exactly the right mix for particular frequencies and it has to do with how much it increases the, the uh, inductance of the things wrapped around it and, and all of that stuff. It's, I did experiments, by the way, remember I said you can wrap it around a rod? I thought, okay, I have some really good magnetic bolts. I mean, some nice, you know, big bolts. Does that help? <laughs> no. Absolutely not. There's just something about the ferrite material that, that interacts with it that it, just a standard uh, machine bolt isn't going to isn't going to do for you. All right. There's another method of dealing with this. And you're probably already in the back of your mind saying, you know, I've seen chokes that weren't anything like that. That's what we're going to be talking about now. Parallel tuned circuits. Parallel tuned circuits. What happens at resonance? their impedance goes way up, right? So if we put a parallel tuned circuit in series between our AC source and our load, at the resonant frequency, the, the current will be severely limited at the resonant frequency of that. So if we could get the outer skin of the coaxial shield to act like a resonant parallel tuned circuit, we could really do a great job of killing common mode current. But boy, oh boy, how do you, how do you get that capacitor on parallel with that outer skin of the shield? Well, it's easier than what you might think. To do this, all we do is we take our coax and we wrap it up into a little coil. You say, well, doesn't that increase the impedance or the inductance? It does. But also think of this. I have a, the shield here, right? I have a, uh, an insulator. I have another piece of insulation. And then I have more conductor. Conductor, insulation, conductor. I think that's a capacitor. So by wrapping this up, we are increasing the parallel capacitance associated with this at the same time as increasing the inductance of the outer shell of the, of the shield. So what does this little guy look like? Well, I took it and put it on my jig and you can see a very sharply tuned circuit. Isn't that interesting? I found that fascinating. Now, I also discovered, while I had it on my jig to measure its performance, that if I put my hand up against this, all of a sudden the sharpness of that tune, the cue just was swamped right out because of the proximity of my hand. I could change how sharply tuned that was by its environment, what was around it. So if you really want to make one of these work, 
It needs to kind of hang out where it's not going to be interfered with if you want the best performance. It's also, as you can probably guess, a single band choke. This is not a wide band common mode choke. Well, my, my thought was, well, what happens if I create a much larger one? So this is RG8X. I don't know how many turns. I don't know how big a round. I just wrapped it up to see what it would do. Well, now you notice that the optimum choking frequency is 3.94 megahertz. That's this guy right here. Now notice too that it has other spots that seem to have some effectiveness. The odd thing about it is that is the fifth and the ninth harmonics of 3.94 megahertz. Uh, co common mode also, this is kind of a side note here, common mode uh, current in your coax can actually change the propagation uh, of your antennas, believe it or not because it is now acting as a counterpoise and it's emanating signals that both add and subtract from your antenna. So the question is, how do we measure the performance of a common mode choke? Very good and important question. As you see on the screen, this very complicated test jig it requires a two-point measurement system like a mini VNA tiny or a nano VNA because what you're doing is you're putting a signal out of one port and you're measuring how, how big that signal is coming back in the other port. And so this is very simple. Mine is a couple BNC connectors with a couple clip leads on it. At 90 degrees, you want those, those clips to be as short as possible, and that's about as short as I could make them. And if they're at 90 degrees, they tend not to interact with each other as much. I started out with uh, a, a lot longer leads, and I found that as frequency went up, they, they talked an awful lot to one another. <laughs> so the shorter your leads can be, the better off you are. But as you see, the test jig is very, very simple. And so what you do is you set up your VNA for what's called an S21 measurement. And you go, what does that mean? It's in, on some little, like the nano VNA, mini VNA, tiny, they might call it a through, they might call it response. But like I said, all they're doing is they're sending a signal out port one. That's the one part of S21 and they're listening for the response signal coming back in port two and telling you what the difference is in dB between those two signals. That's how you measure it. But like you see, it's a very simple test jig. Don't forget if you're gonna do this, do your calibration with your through and isolation. In other words, shorting the two clips together, I use a piece of, uh, of braid to short the two clips together for the through part. And then I take the clip it off and stand back and tell it the isolation, which says, what, what do I hear when there's nothing connected is what it's answering. And then you hook up your, your device, just like you see here. And presto changeo, voila, you see your measurement. Common mode current and chokes in a very fast nutshell. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like and subscribe to this channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots.